In this part of the lecture, we defined graph neural networks and discuss their interpretation as generative models for graph neural networks. We then use graph neural networks to show that GNNs inherit the transferability properties of graph filters. We have already seen that graph filters are transferable between weighted graphs associated with a given graphome. As such, in the same way that GNNs inherit the invariance and stability properties of graph filters, we can expect them to inherit transferability. In order to study whether GNNs are transferable, we will once again turn our attention to graphons and graphon signals. In particular, we will use graphon signal processing to define graphon neural networks or WNNs. The WNN can be defined as a layered architecture where each layer composes a graphon convolution with parameters h and a nonlinearity sigma. The equation on the slide describes the L layer of a WNN with L layers and FL output features. The HKLFG are its learnable weights. Recall that TWK is the graphon diffusion sequence of length k, defined by successive applications of the integral operator with kernel W or graphon shift operator. The WNN input x0 is the graphon signal x. The WNN output y is x uppercase L, the output signal at the last layer of the WNN. Just like a GNN, the graphon neural network can be represented succinctly as a map phi. This map maps the graphon signal x to the graphon signal y, and it is parametrized by the graphon w and the set calligraphic h, which groups the learnable parameters h, k, l, f, j for all layers and all features of the WNN. Consider a graph signal lowercase x on the graph g with shift operator s and let phi be a GNN applied to this graph signal and parametrized by the coefficient set h and the graph shift operator s. In this GNN, we know that the coefficient set h does not depend on the graph g. Likewise, consider a graphon signal uppercase x on the graphon w. The WNN map phi applied to this graphon signal and parametrized by the coefficient set h and the graphon w does not depend on the graphon either. Therefore, GNNs and WNNs can share their learnable coefficients h as shown in the diagram on the slide, meaning that we can use WNNs to instantiate GNNs. In other words, the WNN acts as a generative model for GNNs, in the same way that graphons and graphon signals are generative models for graphs and graph signals. In particular, in our transferability analysis, we will consider GNNs phi on weighted graphs Gn and graph signals Xn instantiated from the WNN phi on the graphon W and graphon signal X. To instantiate a GNN from a WNN, it suffices to instantiate the graph shift operator Sn and the graph signal Xn from the graphon W and graphon signal X. The parameter set H is shared. Recall that to instantiate the graph filter Sn and the graph signal Xn, we first construct a regular n partition of the union interval. Then, we evaluate the graphon and the graphon signal at the endpoints ui of each interval of this partition. Consider a graph signal snxn sampled from the graphon signal wx. And let calligraphic h be the set of coefficients of a graphon neural network with l layers and f features per layer, except for the input features f0 and output features f uppercase l, which are equal to 1. Then, Run a WNN Y with coefficients H on the graphon W to process the graphon signal X. And from this WNN, instantiate a GNN YN with coefficients H on the graph SN to process the graph signal XN. Now we want to compare Y and lowercase by N. But this is not possible because the graphon signal X is a function and the graph signal XN is a vector. To solve this problem, we consider the graphon signal uppercase yn, which is the graphon signal induced by the graph signal lowercase yn. Our transferability results require the same set of assumptions we used when comparing graph filters to graphon filters. This is a triplet of Lipschitz assumptions that we repeat here for reference. We require the graphon to be Lipschitz with Lipschitz constant L1. The filter's frequency response should be Lipschitz constant with constant L2. And the graphon signal X should be Lipschitz with constant L3. Of these three assumptions, it is A2, 
the Lipschitz continuity of the frequency response of the filter, that is fundamental. The other two assumptions are necessary, but they are not conceptually that important. In the case of WNNs and GNNs, we also need a fourth assumption regarding the nonlinearity sigma. The first requirement is that sigma be normalized Lipschitz, which is what we call Lipschitz continuous functions with constant 1. In other words, the absolute value of sigma of x minus sigma of y should never exceed the absolute values of the difference between x and y. The second requirement is that sigma be null at zero. Neither, neither of these requirements are very restrictive, as they are satisfied by most conventional activation functions such as the ReLU, the sigmoid, and the hyperbolic tangent. We also require the same pair of definitions we introduced when comparing graph filters to graphone filters. These definitions require that we fix a bandwidth C to separate eigenvalues that are close to zero from those that are not close to zero. Associated to C, we define the C-band cardinality B and C. This is a count of the number of eigenvalues whose absolute value is larger than C. It is a number we know is finite. Also associated with C, we define the C eigenvalue margin of the graph Gn. This margin is the smallest gap between the graph eigenvalue lambda ni and the graph eigenvalue lambda j with different index. The graph eigenvalue has to be in the C band, but the graph eigenvalue can be anywhere. Typically, this gap is the difference between the graph eigenvalue that is immediately above C and the graph eigenvalue that is immediately below C. With the setup assumptions and definitions in place, we can state the GNN WNN approximation theorem. Consider the graph signal SNXN sampled from the graphon signal WX. Further consider the corresponding GNN and WNN outputs YN and Y. The outputs are the result of processing these signals on the graph and on the graphon, but they both use the same set of coefficients. If assumptions A1 through A4 hold, and considering definitions D1 and D2, the difference between the norms of the induced graphone signal Yn and the graphone signal Y is bounded by the expression shown on the slide. There is a lot going on in this bound. We have terms that depend on the number of nodes of the graph. They are sums of inverse square roots and vanish as n and n grows. The summons are scaled by the Lipschitz constants of the graphone and the filter's frequency response and the graphone signal. We also have terms that depend on the bandwidth C, along with the corresponding C band cardinality and the C eigenvalue margin of the graph Gn. Finally, the bound also depends on the WNN depth L and the width F. And we also have the norm of the graphone signal X appearing in the bound. The proof of the theorem is an extrapolation of the graph graphone filter approximation theorem for multiple layers and features. You can find it in the lecture notes that are available on the course's website. The GNN WNN approximation theorem tells us that the error incurred when using a GNN to approximate a WNN can be upper bounded. And the approximation bound is practically the same as the one we obtain when approximating graphone filters with graph filters, with an additional dependence on GNN depth L and width F, meaning that deeper and wider GN WNNs are harder to approximate. The GNN-WNN approximation theorem is important because it is the stepping stone to proving transferability of GNNs. This is because the distance between GNNs and the WNN can be combined to bound the distance between GNNs supported on weighted graphs with a different number of nodes instantiated from a graphone. Consider the WNNs YN induced by the GNN on the M node graph GN and YM induced by the GNN on the M node graph GM. The distance between YN and YM can be bounded by adding and subtracting the graphone signal y and splitting the sum between the error incurred when approximating the WNN with the GNN on n nodes and the error incurred when approximating the WNN with the GNN on m nodes. The sum can be split in two by the triangle inequality. Because the two error terms on the left hand side are bounded, we have proved GNN transferability from GN to GM. Let us formally set up the transferability problem for GNNs. Consider the graph signals SNXN and SMXM sampled from the graphon signal WX. And let calligraphic H be the set of coefficients of a graph neural network with L layers and F features per layer, 
except for the input features F0 and output features F uppercase L, which are equal to 1. Then, run a GNN YN with coefficients H on the graph GN to process the graph signal XN, and a GNN YM with coefficients H on the graph GM to process the graph signal XM. Now, we want to compare YN and YM. But this is not possible because these are graph signals and therefore vectors with different dimensions n and m. To solve this problem, we consider the induced graphon signals uppercase yn and uppercase ym. With the same set of assumptions and definitions used in the GNN WNN approximation theorem, we can now state the GNN transferability theorem. Consider the graph signals snxn and smxm sampled from the graphon signal Wx. Further consider the corresponding GNN outputs Yn and Ym. The outputs are the result of processing these signals on the graphs Gn and Gm, but they both use the same set of filter coefficients. If assumptions A1 through A4 hold, and considering definitions D1 and D2, the difference between the norms of the induced graphon signals Yn and Ym is bounded by the exp expression shown on the slide. Again, there is a lot going on on this bound. Like before, we have terms that depend on the number of nodes of the graphs. They are sums of inverse square roots and vanish as n and m grow. The summons are scaled by the Lipschitz constants of the graphon, the filter's frequency response, and the graphon signal. We also have terms that depend on the bandwidth C along with the corresponding C band cardinalities and the C eigenvalue margins of the graphs Gn and Gm. The bound depends on the larger of the two C band cardinalities and the minimum of the two C eigenvalue margins. We pick the worst of the two in each case, the one that makes the bound largest. Finally, the bound also depends on the WNN depth L and the width L. And we also have the norm of the graphon signal X appearing in the bound. The same comments made for the graph filter transferability theorem apply here, as the bound is almost exactly the same. The only difference is the dependence on the depth L and width F of the GNN. Because the GNN transferability bound looks almost exactly like the graph filter transferability bound, one might be inclined to think that graph filters and GNNs present the same discriminability transferability non trade off. But in the case of GNNs, this non-trade-off actually becomes a trade-off. The nonlinearities help. At each layer of the GNN, after the graph convolution, the, gra the nonlinearity sigma effectively scatters the eigenvalues of the graph around the spectra. In doing so, they allow some of the eigenvalues in the C-band to be scatter scattered to the upper and lower ends of the spectrum corresponding to eigenvalues with magnitude larger than C where these eigenvalues can later be discriminated by the graph convolutions of the upcoming layer. The nonlinearities does alleviate the discriminability transferability trade-off. They give us room to decrease the C-band and increase the filter variability L2, allowing to increase discriminability while retaining transferability. This effect of nonlinearities is not reflected in the GNN transferability bound we have derived, which is almost the same as the graph filter transferability bound. But it makes it so that, for the same level of discriminability, GNNs are more transferable than graph filters.